And it's really important how you perceive change because that will be the way how you will lead your life. And for some it's digital, but if you turn around, and you please do turn around, you see beautiful nature. So being in Blit makes me really optimistic. And thinking about how to start this morning yesterday, my son watching the soccer game, by the way, Slovenia won. Yeah, good. Asked me, but mom, what are you doing? Why are you not cheering for our team? And I basically always cheer for our team because all of us are our team. But uh, he asked me, so what are you doing? And I said, I'm preparing for the business breakfast. And he asked me, what will you cook? <laughs> Nothing. But we have on the menu really excellent speakers and excellent team in the public. And we will be as one while addressing the changing reality. With that, I would like to invite our first guest speaker, Terry Kennedy, Teresa Kennedy, who is an entrepreneur. She is really, how to say, you, you always bring energy in, but you're always putting it as well out. There are so many things that I could tell about Teresa. She was teaching leaders in the Chinese wall how to be here and now, she almost, not really a pleasant part of your story, but she almost died before she realized she needs to change her life. So with that, Teresa, please join us. And um, I would really like to ask you one thing. What makes your heart sing? Tell me three things that really make your heart sing. Always, we need to do some uh, digital, uh, natural uh, things. So, I love that question. And first of all, thank you for in inviting me here. I love Slovenia. Uh, yeah, it's my third time here, and I have fallen in love. Uh, what makes my heart sing is the act of creating uh, and uh, turning no thing, nothing, into something, uh, and th turning thought into matter. Um, so whether it's creating a book, I've, I'm on my fifth now, uh, I'm a writer and producer at heart, uh, or whether, and that starts with a thought and then it's words on paper and then it's a physical form, um, or whether it's creating a company, uh, creating a business, uh, and, you know, I, I, I founded VH1 Interactive in the early days of the Internet, before the commercial Internet, uh, and then you know, we morphed onto the Internet. And, and it was a thought. It was, no one knew anything about online, really. Um, that became a design that was programmed into a site that became a business. And so, you know, for me, it is the pure potentiality uh, of the art of creating. Uh, and, and a lot of the work I do is, is, is reminding people uh, of that power, uh, of, of pure potentiality. And actually, so I'm very interactive always in what I do. So if you will, will you repeat after me? I am pure potentiality. I'm pure potentiality. My thoughts create my reality. My thought creates my reality. And so, you know, we are creators of our own realities, and, and then collectively, we are co-creators of our shared reality, our shared world. And, uh, and again, it's in the first, in the recognition of that, is the first, you know, step. Um, With yeah. that, I'll invite uh, our second speaker, Crystal Hoffman. Such a potential is her company. She's director, I, and I planned it all. So welcome, Crystal. Uh, to tell you about Crystal a bit, she works, she's a change manager. She works with startups, big companies, with cities, and her belief, but why don't I ask you what your beliefs are? Please, Crystal, join us on stage and tell us three beliefs that are essential for you. There are so many. 
Um, one of the beliefs is that uh, we can really work together. The old reality can really cooperate with new innovative realities. And uh, yesterday it was already on the on the Congress that people talked about the uh, that we have to to find uh, a common uh, uh, how do you say that uh, basics that we be, be that we both share and from that we grow. And uh, my belief is that we can grow and that we must not throw everything that is old away. We emerge on every step. We emerge every time. It's not something against something. It's something emerging on something. Mm -hmm. That's one of my strongest beliefs. Right. And last but not least, let me invite Mark Blasic. His mother is from Slovenia. I always try to tell something interesting about people. But I, I really need to read about you because there are so many things, Mark, that you do that it's really hard to follow. And I need to ask you how you manage. But you are former army officer wor working in White House, Pentagon for big uh, law companies, firms on really important um, subjects, really hard subjects. And now you're a producer in Hollywood. So I don't get it. Uh, OK, anyway, try to explain that. Please, Mark, join us. So tell me, what is essential to you? What defines you? Because all these titles that we have read are interesting, but is this something that defines you or is it something else? Um, so I have a very good canned answer, which is a great answer to that. But we were talking beforehand. I said, I can give that or I can give the truth. And of course, <laughs> you have a great hostess. So she's like, I want the truth, dig deep. <laughs> Uh, so the answer to that is actually, I was a, I'm currently I teach at Georgetown University, but many years ago I was very lucky to be a student at Georgetown. Um, as you know, George, as you may know, the Georgetown are uh, the founders of that are a group of uh, Jesuit priests, and they their motto is being a man or, or woman for others, and that's uh, comes from a, a letter from Saint John or someone to someone else very important in history that says, "Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good." And that was something that when I was studying at Georgetown and I studied theology as well, it really spoke to me. And it's been kind of a guiding force of the things I've done in and out of public service. I started my career after getting my Juris Doctorate um, uh, in, at the War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, working on the Sherman to Genocide case and the Slobodan Milosevic case, which are I mean, terrible, terrible things to work on and to experience as you know, many people here have firsthand experience but to try to find a way to find justice out of that was a good thing, and something to try to find the goodness of a terrible situation. Later on in life, after working for the White House and the Secretary of Defense, I wound up working at the World Bank, where I helped set up a unit that helps recover stolen assets from dictators. So again, understanding that dictators steal lots of money as well as hurting people, what can the international community do collectively to go after the money that was stolen because it does not belong to these dictators, it belongs to the people of those countries. We'll go more deep into it, but uh, with all of three of you, uh, I don't know, did we inform you that the breakfast will last till lunch and, and dinner? <laughs> but really, thank you all for being here. When we talk about change realities, do we really talk about realities now, or we always try to look into the future? And I asked you to bring one picture that kind of associates you with the perfect future. And I, I would like to start with you, Terry. What is that picture and what it represents? Ah. <laughs> so I chose this image of a, a girl blowing a dandelion uh, in a green field. Uh, and in many places, there is a tradition of making a wish and blowing a dandelion uh, and allowing that wish to go out in, into the universe. And, and so for me, this picture represents the potential um, in our, our, our children and also our imperative uh, to make sure that they believe in their potential. Uh, and and in that regardless of where the child is born or the gender 
or ethnicity or religion or any of that, um, that that child should know his or her potential and be able to realize it. Also, dandelions happen to be found on every continent. And so it, it reminds us of our interconnectedness and, and the, again, imperative to preserve the environment uh, for that girl. We have decision makers here in the audience. They're from business, they're from governments. What should each of them, of us, do to do to preserve mm -hmm. that planet? Is this something that you believe in? Can we change it? Can we be part of it? Or would you just go with the flow? No. Can we be a part of it? We must be a part of it. Uh, and and, and that, that's also the message, that if you have breath on this earth, then it, you really have a responsibility um, to be a part of the solution. Uh, and, 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 and it starts with conscious decisions. You know, intention plus focus attention leads to conscious action, which in, in our equation is what we call purpose with results. And that's true power. And if all of our leaders can start there um, with that, uh, an intention to create uh, a, a much better world and, they real, and look at downstream implications, uh, then we'll be at a, in a much better place. But it starts with true intention, not just going with the flow. We're, we're past that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell yeah. us one situation that you really felt that you are doing it for this girl? <laughs> just one. I know there are many. There are many. We, we read your story. Not all of you, but you should check. <laughs> but uh, one thing that you would say you are really proud of. Actually, and you know a little bit about this, it, it's my current work with my teacher, who's 99 years old. She is the oldest yoga master in the world. Uh, and uh, she marched with Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and she worked in the French resistance under General de Gaulle. I co-wrote her autobiography with her uh, and my mom, who's a journalist. Uh, and and the, my work now is curating experiences with Tao uh, and different audiences, whether it's at the UN, it's at our US Pentagon, we've done programs in, in Dubai for the World Government Summit. So it's, it's showing an example of almost a century of this conscious, mindful living and decision making. Uh, and so if I can continue to to do that and place her in, in different environments that shifts the energy. When we did the program at the UN last year, the ambassador, the Indian ambassador said, the energy shifted within the chambers of the, the UN. The ambassadors put down their prepared notes and actually started speaking from the heart. And so if we, if part of it is encourage people, people going from the mind to the heart. Uh, Believe in Slovenia, be yeah. love. Uh, this is something that we truly believe in, and I really hope that for the 100th birthday, Tao will celebrate in Blade Pahin. She <laughs> loves it. <laughs> right. Crystal, uh, the future, which is now, on your picture presents what? <laughs> yeah, this is a, a, a group of elderly and students in the, Holland, in the Netherlands, and... Um, they, uh, I think it's very special because they were really living apart from each other. One, the elderly in one system, and the, the younger ones, the students in the other system. They didn't have any contact. They only had opinions about each other. The elderly thought about the students that they were lazy. They had strange dreams, just having fun and parties, were irresponsible, all those kind of things. And the students had their own opinions about the elderly. And they were thinking about the elderly, that they were slowly, that they were not uh, in so part of society anymore, that they were just living in the park, all those things. They, they never came up to do something together at all. But they, had, they both had a problem, and they couldn't solve that problem for themselves. And the elderly had the problem of that they uh, were lacking social contact. Um, they wanted to do things, and they needed help, and they, okay, they had a, a lack of social contact. And the students, they had a lack of uh, places to live during their student time in, it is in Amsterdam, actually. And um, 
an organization came up with the idea, okay, we put those groups together, although they don't like each other, and we will see what comes out, out of it. And it works fine. It worked really great, but they learned. They opened up. First, they were like a closed system. They opened up. They learned that the students learned that the elderly people were people with dreams, were people who loved, the people who liked to have fun and also have their parties. And the uh, elderly learned from the st that the students were also a little bit the same. They were not lazy. They had dreams. They were they were they were they had inspiration. They were wanted to go on like just like the elderly did before. So they learned to see that they were somewhere a little bit the same. And that made that they were living, starting to live together in this home, what I think is really great. Okay, they had their own, own rooms and own, own parts, but they lived together. <coughs> and, uh, and now they say that the elderly learned from the youngers how to use iPads, um, smartphones, uh, they get interest in new things. And the young people get, uh, the students get more respect for the, the, the values of the, the and the, 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 the life those elderly people had. They learn that if something goes wrong, like a bad uh, degree or a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend who breaks up, your life does stop. It just goes on and you can have new adventures and learn new things. So for me, it stands like, just to close it, <laughs> for me, it really stands like two realities really apart not having any contact, having opinions about each other, coming together, opening up, seeing from one on the other side and the, from both sides, seeing similarities and grow on that and learn new things, open. That's that's amazing story. And we have one from Slovenia. Uh -huh. It's called Partnership for Change. And Great. we started to exchange workers, people from public administration who worked in business and vice yeah. versa. And what we learned, yeah. similar as yeah. you did. And I see many faces that we met, we became team, uh, and it's really different because uh, going through the stereotypes, it helps a lot. Yeah. And for you, Mark, you chose planet Earth. Now I really want to hear the story. <laughs> so I'll be a little controversial. When we, um, when we were talking about the panel, it seemed like a very dramatic question. And I was thinking, um, there's you know, a lot of talk in many circles that we have to save the planet. And I would suggest to you, the planet will be fine. We need to worry about us. From a distance, this place will always be this beautiful blue planet. The question is what happens to us? And as I would suggest, as we think to our future, we need to be better thoughtful, more thoughtful, I should say, regarding how we interact with each other and we, how we make this planet a better place for all of us for our own personal sustainability, because it turns out that will impact the rest of the sustainability of the planet. Because if one of the first things to go will be us. The planet, she's beautiful, she'll be fine. Oh, you said she. Because of course. <laughs> we could go to the gut and all look that, but panel, I don't want to now. Look at the panel I'm on, on. I'm the only guy <laughs> here. How lucky am I? <laughs> okay, good one. Um, I really want to show also Tao, because uh, when you were talking about her, about um, what a great person she is, when you see her, mm -hmm. this is Tao, 99. 99 years old, and, and she's the example of what's possible. <laughs> uh, and, and that truly, it's not just this motivational statement, you know, that you're pure potentiality. Uh, here is this woman. Um, you know, again, who was a French resistance fighter, was a model, an actress, an entrepreneur. She published a newspaper for 30 years in 45 countries. She, you know, um, she was an early TV executive uh, and now is the oldest yoga master in the world. And Guinness World Records is about to announce something else in terms of her ballroom dancing, being the oldest ballroom dancer. So, uh, and she's continuing to, to go. Uh, and it starts for her with the mind. You used mind and heart. So wh what is it? Mind or heart? It's both. And, and you know, it, it is being... I heard both from somebody. <laughs> Who said both? Right over here. <laughs> oh, you did. Okay, right. okay. Right. So and it was the echo then. It's well, it, it, and I'm, I guess I am a, a prime I example. I was an art and sociology double major in college. So I painted and I did statistics. 
Um, and, and then I went to business school. So it's sort of like, what in the world, you know? Uh, and, and it is this holographic thinking. Um, it, it is, you know, being in the mind and, and, you know, thinking logically, but then dropping down into the heart to say, what's my gut? You know, um, you know how does this feel? Does it feel right? Uh, and you need both. Krista, is this something that people should ask themselves in organizations, in the business, in the companies? Because if you start to be just mind or just heart, you'll start losing at one point. So is this something that you truly believe in, holacracy, having uh, companies, organizations, leading without leaders? Uh, yes. <laughs> Well, leading without leaders is a big theme. It's not complete without leaders because we are leaders ourselves in those companies. And we lead from yeah. our minds and our hearts. What we really feel that is our, our, our talent that we need to do in purpose of your role and in purpose of that company, you can do. That is what you do in those companies. So yeah, the mm -hmm. heart and the mind are coming together. Very and important. I know, Mark, that um, you switched to Hollywood to TV, because for you it was not enough just to do good yourself. Why, with all the things that you've done so far, you went to Hollywood? So one of my passions uh, growing up was history and uh, kind of the great civilizations. I watched Indiana Jones movies, if you remember that series, and it really inspired me to travel. It's the reason I took a year off between university and law school to backpack around the world and use my life savings to kind of see these great sights. And when you go to these places, you see they've largely been looted, which really troubled me. And then years later, when I worked in The Hague, I was surprised how a particular warring force used limited munitions to build cultural heritage sites, uh, sites uh, in the region. And later on, when I worked for the White House in the Secretary of Defense, I was surprised how often kings, presidents, and prime ministers wanted to go visit a museum or a cultural site. And you know, this is important to our mill-mill relationship, which led me to then uh, work on a case regarding uh, some looted antiquities that had been stolen uh, during the Camus Rouge days, and someone's trying to sell them in New York City. So I got more involved in the policy issues, which you would expect from a lawyer. Um, that involved uh, helping work uh, with uh, the head of UNESCO, trying to kind of raise this issue to the World Economic Forum in Davos at a kind of stratospheric discussion point, and then working with the US Congress to try to get legislation passed to kind of respond to the crisis going on in the Middle East, particularly to ensure that antiquities from Syria would not be trafficked in the US markets. But you recognize in all these things you can do things at the policy level, the kind of the senior level in Davos. You can work on the governmental level, passing legislation, but that actually does not create change. To create change, you have to bring people with you. And that's the big challenge. We were, uh, she and I are actually both in Japan for the World Economic Forum Young Global Leader Community uh, convening. And the current Minister of Education, Esteban Bullrich of Argentina, explained in Japan, I thought this was beautiful, that when you ask directions in Japan, they don't point you the way, they take you with you. And he said, more leaders today need to spend less time pointing the way and more time taking people with you. So for me, the lesson learned there is how do you engage a broader community? And I think that's through the power of television and media. Because for a lot of folks today, they're not going to pick up a book and read about the great civilizations and learn about the looting. But if you put together an entertaining you know, scripted drama, a TV series, that helps educate them, through and send something active, something will pay for itself, it's sustainable because we sell soap on television, um, then you can use that platform to engage people with a companion website that helps tell the story behind the story. So I'm now working on a new TV series in development, so think Indiana Jones meets James Bond, meets CSI, Homeland, Da Vinci Code. Uh, it's about an army officer turned war crimes prosecutor turned professor who helps recover looted antiquities, but it's really a way to engage young people, particularly in a world where more and more people are using devices to learn more about what's going on in the world. Whoa, perfect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll come back to that because uh, this will be also something that our uh, guest Alex will explain. But before that, there will be Matias, who is changing the reality of medicine. We are proud that he's from Slovene, so let's invite Matias to the podium. Matias Schumann. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm from um, Jozef Stefan Institute and University of Ljubljana, but um, I've been working for, for three years at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital, so really one of the best uh, institutions uh, in the biomedical research. 
um, and we're also um, working with uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I'm actually a physicist, um, but when I came there at Harvard, they put me directly into surgery room. So here is a, a peak, and they say just cut, cut the peak. And it was a, a shock at first, but then it was really a nice experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> overall. <laughs> um, so before I was working with, with uh, lasers, and you know lasers are also useful for, uh, for example, for uh, medical applications. Uh, but a laser and like biological system or a patient, they're usually separated. So the idea was to, to join these things together. Like for example, to put a peak or actually a cell into the laser or uh, put really a laser inside our body or, or actually make uh, lasers really out of biological material. Uh, why we want to do that? Um, because um, when we integrate these two, we can uh, make better uh, treatments, medical treatments, diagnosis, and so on. But also if you want, this is also like sci science fiction. So lasers that are uh, living, they divide, and also you can make a uh, uh, laser out of like the human body, like a cyborg uh, uh, kind of thing. Um, so what we did, actually, we just uh, f uh, for the first time put a small laser, this is this green, uh, green sphere, uh, to the cells, and cells eat the, the lasers, and you have a laser inside, and you can do, for example, diagnosis. What we also um, uh, realized is that our body already contains lasers in the fat cells. And um, um, so uh, in science fiction, you see from lasers from the eyes, but in reality, uh, we made uh, <laughs> lasers from fat, from fat cells. <laughs> Actually, later we also implanted lasers into the eyes, uh, but it's another story also for di diagnostics of the eye uh, diseases. Um, and this also had a huge impact in uh, international and Slovenian uh, media. Um, another thing, just sh shortly, is that we used also lasers and um, optical waveguides, like optical fibers that are used for internet, to Im implant them into skin to glue together wounds. Um, and this works mu much better than, than like just stitching. Um, and if you are interested more about this, um, this was also shot on a, a TV show, The White Rabbit Project on Netflix, uh, if you are more interested. These are the guys from, from the Meatbusters, if, if you know <laughs> them. Um, and uh, finally, I came uh, from United States uh, a year ago uh, here to Slovenia to open my own lab. And we continue to work on these things. And just shortly, um, w uh, one example, what we do is to implant the lasers uh, below the skin, like uh, with a um, uh, tattoo gun, like making a normal tattoo, but instead of the um, normal tattoo, you make lasers inside the skin and you can use this for diagnostics, for example, to measure um, glucose in diabetic patients. Uh, this is just one, one example. And I would like to conclude. Thank you. Matthias, wow. I adore scientists. Thanks God I'm blonde. I can ask really crazy questions. <laughs> so putting laser into the cell technologically is really something I, can, I cannot even imagine. But what this means for the quality of life for people? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially for, for diagnostics. For example, diabetic patients, they have to, uh, to take blood to measure uh, sugar. But if you would have such such tattoos, such lasers inside, you would just um, uh, read out glucose level. This is just one example, but that there are many possibilities. Also treatments like uh, uh, killing bacteria, and th there are ma many, many possibilities, and also w in the research. W what drives you? Is it, I'll do something that nobody did so far, it will be really a technological wow, or you really think about what good it will do? Uh, at first, is this wow? Le let's put a laser in inside. I don't know what what to do with that. <laughs> but then later, I realized there are really a lot of um, a lot of applications. But initially, just out of curiosity. And uh, that's good. Uh, we should remind ourselves to stay curious. Mm -hmm. Many goods come out of that. Matthias, thank you. It was great having you. You will be with us. Thank you. When we talk that we believe in Slovenia, or we say be love, 
We also believe in Slovenia because of people like uh, Matias, but also Alex is the one that makes us believe. So Alex, please. Uh, I guess the speakers here. So I, I want to show you um, what um, is happening to the internet uh, and what is happening to the space of technology. Uh, this is the way that um, different technologies have been uh, introduced um, to humanity. Basically, as, uh, as we go, let me try not to blind anyone with the laser. <laughs> uh, and there is no laser. But as, uh, as we go uh, from left, which is the past, to the right, which is the future, you notice that different technologies get adopted uh, by greater and greater percentages of, of the population. Uh, so electricity and radio took um, a fair bit of time. Um, you know, for example, at the top, you know, the, the leftmost uh, uh, curves show the adoption of telephone uh, adoption of electricity, adoption of cars. Um, for example, the cars started being adopted uh, already at the turn of, of the previous century, but it, it was really around the 50s and 60s that uh, they really started changing the way that uh, our cities, our villages, uh, our countries are being run. Now, computers uh, came to forefront in the 80s, 90s, okay? So now we're, we're seeing a couple of things um, how they're how they're affecting our society, but these are smartphones and tablets. Okay, we're only at the very very beginning, and this is what I'm referring to as connectivity revolution. You know, because we're going to have you know the world's knowledge in our pockets. We're going to have access to everyone in the world in our pockets. I was uh, in Mexico um, in, in this village that doesn't have paved roads. Um, electricity might be or might not be. There is no, no toilets, no flushing, okay? But there are hand-drawn Wi-Fi symbols on, on, on the bars and restaurants. So, uh, you know, this connectivity is, is extremely powerful. There are more smartphones than, I mean, more telephones than toilets in many places. But there are dangers. So, you know, we're, who here isn't using Google? No one. Yet Google is accumulating all this information about us, knows who we're talking to. Even if I wasn't using Google, if you're using Google and I send you an email, Google is going to know. Okay, if Stasi or KGB or whatever secret organization wanted to have as much information well, it wouldn't be possible, but yet we have private companies that have this level of information and we're relying on them to give us what we perceive is an objective portrayal of information that's available. So these are search results that Google presents from news. Okay, and there are a couple of numbers um, that indicate what percentage of news links come from certain media sites. And you, you notice it's very concentrated. I mean, it's true that not all of these brands of media are equally represented, but what matters is that 98% of links that are posted by Google in the search results come essentially from the political left. Now, you know, all of us are using Google, so obviously this is our reality and this is the truth and everything has an alternative fact, but the reality is, you know, this, um, mindset has lost the American presidential elections. So, you know, maybe we, we're in a bubble. So, um, and you know, as, as this event goes on, I, I really like thinking and talking about how to, um, how to have a safe, um, prospering, sustainable information sphere. And it's not going to be accomplished by just letting things go the way they're going right now. With that, Alex, um, I'll ask you to stay with us. And the initial question that I had for you, you have these small papers 
we are back in the times when the paper was invented so many thousand years ago. But uh, what I would like you to do is really to draw now. Because as you know, and Terry maybe can explain, when you draw and not write, something else is happening in your mind. So you should draw one invention, one thing, that really, in your opinion, in past 60 years, because as we see how, how fast things are developing, changed our reality. Uh, and we give you one minute to think and draw something. Can we do that? Half a minute to go. I know a uh, visionary in this room, many basically, but one that impressed us all with his stubbornness to change things. I really wonder, um, Minister Kuprionikar, is this an empty one? Oh, okay, I, I thought it's an empty uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's not empty, but I strongly believe that uh, internet or connected networks really changed our lives because it's now able that we communicate, share, be coming together and uh, what you're talking before is now it's able that we have all the knowledge of all the centuries of development of the humanity on our smartphone. And this really boosts our creativity. So for me, this is the most important invention. Great. Let's see what was um, here. Yuri. What was uh, your drawing? I have paper. He doesn't have paper. You oh, should have a smartphone <laughs> then. <laughs> Let's see. Hi, I, um, I drew the, uh, the personal computer because I think a, a lot of the changes which have happened in the last half century have grown out of the development of a desktop computer that you can have in your home. Uh, and maybe it's just my own, uh, my own life uh, going through school, it was a big deal to have your own computer. So I think a lot of the current uh, connectivity and changes are an outgrowth of the, uh, the personal computer. Martin, can I ask you where do you come from? I am the uh, Senior Trade Commissioner at the uh, Canadian Embassy. Welcome to Slovenia, the only country in the world with love in the name. So um, I really like when people go like, no, 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 I'll come back there, I'll come back. Uh-huh, okay. Hello, I'm Andrea from Slovenia. I drove a smartphone, but it was actually not the smartphone I meant, but more the applications that are on it for communication, like WhatsApp, like Messenger, because today you can have this connection in another way than you, we had before. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. So all of you, did anybody draw a social invention or was everything in technology? What was that? Well, it may look as I'm on the wrong part of the panel today, but I uh, draw a contraception pill <laughs> because <laughs> it liberated half of society and uh, allow us to have such a nice uh, panel today. <laughs> Whatever. Thank you. What would be your drawings? Uh, Alex, uh, we really want to come back to because when I was talking about technology opportunities, I rarely mention fear, but you start to doing it. So should we start from that or ask you what was the invention that you were thinking of? I think it works. Okay. 
I mean, sure, you know, smartphone is something that's, uh, that's sort of in front of us. It's, uh, it's a new technology. We need to figure it out, uh, use it properly. Uh, you know, we, we, have this, um, we have these platforms that we're implicitly relying upon. Um, I don't know, but, but really platform, you know, it, it's, like, it's like a kind of an information government. So in, in some sense, what, what's coming next is the fact that we're going to have institutions that are currently built on top of paper and telephone and road have to become built upon the technology, this, uh, you know, um, ambient connectivity around us. It's going to change uh, the way we work. You know, for example, if you, if you think, uh, imagine having a policeman on a horse when there are cars buzzing by. You know, so when, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's not going to be liars and cops regulating it. It's going to be AI regulating AI. You know, we need machine law. There are all these things that are coming that still kind of need to be invented. And it's something that affects so many of us. We cannot just leave it to a couple of companies. You know, we need to establish a kind of a playing ground, a kind of a you know, proper public platform <laughs> for these technologies to, uh, to interoperate with each other. Mark, is it if the platform is public, are we more safe? Are we more secure? I think it depends who's the folks behind those operations. Uh, you know, to your point, uh, the, the ability for us to voluntarily give all our personal information to a third company to outside of the realm of our regular worlds is an amazing choice that we make. You know, when I joined the Army, I, went, I had a security clearance, uh, and I firmly gave all this additional information to the U.S. government. Now I give all this information to Facebook and Google and others because I want to use a platform. But what's scary for me is that's something everyone here is doing voluntarily. There's the terms and conditions, you clicked it, and now they have it. I was at the Munich Security Conference a few years ago, and General Hayden, who was the head of the CIA, was being uh, kind of poked at at this kind of nightcap session. You know, why did you target Angry Birds? And he said, listen, I'm not gonna talk about, you know, Angry Birds and the CIA's involvement there because we can't talk about that, but let me ask you this. How many people who have downloaded Angry Birds, actually in this room, raise your hand. People who have downloaded it. Now, when you downloaded that, did you read the terms and conditions? The answer obviously is no, nobody does. And when you download something for free, as General Hayden said, you are the product. And that really hit me, because the terms and conditions sucked in all that information for your phone, and now they have it. And so it's something I think, to your point, we need to think more of. When we voluntarily give this information, we are the product. In fact, Angry Birds tracking your location around the world, as well as probably a few dozen million others. Yep, and something to, to that point, so I didn't download Angry Birds, um, but I do have Uber, which I think is fantastic. But Uber, as you may know, just recently changed the app. So now, in theory, it's meant to track you for the five minutes afterwards. But as I've heard, and as you'll probably tell me, that is just a theory. They can always track you. So now the tracking for my Uber is off all the time, which is annoying. I have to type in the address. But that's how I've tried to respond to the fact that I don't want Uber to know where I am on planet Earth every day of the week. Can I ask you now a completely different perspective? Why does it matter? Is it like when we moved from the villages to the cities and nobody really cared for each other anymore? Is it now the same? When they know everything, does it really matter? Every technological revolution in the past has been usually followed by a big war. You know, when one group of people figured out how to use this technology and, and many other people were sort of naive and, and wishful about it. Uh, so it's, um, it's a threat, you know, the best way to um, prevent war is to predict it. You know, it's, um, it's an unhappy prediction, uh, you know, which hopefully doesn't come true. But, um, you know, we have to recognize that if, you know, if Hitler or whoever is the Hitler or Stalin of today, you know, they're probably not an editor like Stalin. You know, they're probably not a painter like Hitler, but um, they're probably trying to get 
you know, a nice vice president position in one of these companies because that's going to give them a great position for a power grab. Is it the war just in physical sense or is it in the cybersecurity and the security sense? You know, cybersecurity is, is a broad topic, but I think when people think about cybersecurity, uh, they're mostly thinking about nation states attacking other nation states' uh, information systems. Um, I think uh, a lot of uh, our security thinking really needs to be done at, uh, at this um, you know, threat prevention level, which is, um, you know, which is just our own lives. You know, we're, you know, we're products for, uh, for all these companies that are you know, selling us things, um, but not necessarily serving us. You know, for example, uh, there is all this, um, you know, propaganda about having to travel and how wonderful it is to travel. Um, I mean, we're in bled after all, but, you know, reality is, I mean, is this really important for our lives? I think what's important is for us to meet and talk. I don't think it's that important for us to really, you know, travel and burn all this jet fuel. I'm so <laughs> happy I have two women on the stage <laughs> because whenever I become nervous, I start doing like this, and then I see the sign infinity. Can we just disconnect, or <laughs> should we be more connected in terms to change things? Well, with one comment before that is, you know, the old time coups, but my, my, I was born in Ghana, my parents are Amer American, but I was born in Ghana, and so I school in Australia, and, but my family's been through some coups. Uh, and, and, and so the old time, you know, the coup, you take over the communication, you take over the media, it's one of the first things you do. Uh, and, and so in listening to you, you know, it is quite a different world. Um, that ambient connectivity, as you were talking about, um, of the information coup, you know, uh, of, of, of being able to um, shift power structures in a very different way because of where our information technology is. So this is a, a comment. Yeah. Your, your question about um, disconnecting, can we disconnect? Uh, absolutely, and, and in fact, uh, I in a world that is more complex and faster, and, and we need to pause. It's the power of the pause. Uh, and, and some of the greatest leaders use the power of the pause um, right before making key decisions. Uh, and so as things are spinning faster, uh, it, it is learning, you know, how uh, in that vortex um, to uh, be still for a moment um, so you can, you know, tune in to make the right next decision. Um, I disconnect. Sometimes people cannot find me. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you simply have to make the choice uh, and, and, and then set expectations. Uh, for the people around you. But am I really disconnected, then, is the question. Because if my phone is near me, or, you know, then I'm, I'm not really, I guess, right? But from a human standpoint, uh, I, I can mentally, you know, disconnect, and I think we need to do that. It's what the, what the, there are two professors at Harvard, Benson and Proctor, and they talk about the breakout principle. Uh, and, and when you are pressed and, and thinking about something, trying to make a decision, and then you pause and step back, they explain you know, what the brain does to allow for insight to come. Uh, and they train people um, in organizations about how to actually you know, create these insights. It's in the pause. But when you talk about disconnecting, it's uh, mobile disconnecting, but somehow we are connected, not horizontally, maybe vertically. But that's another story. <laughs> Uh, so, Crystal, uh, in holacracy, I have a feeling that we completely trust the people. We trust the people that they are good, that they find their mission, that they don't need somebody to follow to tell them what's true. Do you completely trust people in their good? Um, yeah, that's the basic thought, is that you trust, uh, trust them that they uh, live their full potential. But I agree with that's what you were talking about. What people really have to learn to use their full potential is to slow down and to really reflect on what, is, uh, what are their talents, 
What do they have to do for uh, reaching the purpose of the roles and the purpose of the company? So learning that takes a while. It's not just like that you do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's about it. I really wonder um, if you can show me if you think you really can pause and slow down, show me like this. And if you think you are in the middle, do it like this. And if you think that you are completely almost in a stress, show me like this. Can I see what this, wow. Can we test it out for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously. Yeah, yeah Terry, do it. I, I've done this in stealth mode at the World Economic Forum <laughs> and other <laughs> venues. Uh, close your eyes for a moment. I won't do anything really, you know, crazy. Uh, and, and simply tune in to where you are right in this moment. Because that's always the first step is tuning in. Simply notice your breath. Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it deep? Is it shallow? You're simply being a witness. That's where it starts. All this talk about mindfulness. It's simply noticing. And then consciously take a breath. So you're inhaling, you're filling with more energy. And you exhale and just open your mouth and just sigh. <sighs> and then open your eyes. That's a pause. Now, I do it before every board meeting. <laughs> do it before any transition into anything. Uh, is you tune in so you can be present with your decisions. I love how we started the business part of the Blade Strategic Forum. Because it, normal way, it should be about numbers, about goals, decisions. But to pause is something that I have learned. I, I really hope that we will remember that even tomorrow and after tomorrow and so on. So, Mark, uh, talking about TV, and I, I, I really wonder, because I think Alex might have a different opinion, but let's see. So, Mark, you said you want to have the social impact TV, you want to bring people along to, to do some good. But then again, um, will the young people really follow you as they really need more clicks, they need to uh, be wired to different uh, media? Are you implying I'm not young myself? <laughs> <laughs> you said so. <laughs> we're, we're both young global leaders. It's part of the title. <laughs> um, listen, so I, I'm aspirational. Um, I understand the fact that if I personally care about this cultural heritage stuff, but not everyone cares about, which is totally fine, but how do you better educate people to care? And for me, my path happened to be, you know, watching the Jones movies, which helped create an interest, and how do you generate that interest? And I do think that you know, when it comes to um, kind of the, the media sector, there's a huge appetite for great content. This is something that's talked about all the time in, in, in Hollywood. And now you have other um, uh, platforms, you know, Facebook that says they want to spend a billion dollars on content. That's pretty tremendous, because right now the content is everyone in this room. We generate ourselves to, you know, for, their, for, for, for Facebook's purposes. How then do you basically leverage this to engage others to learn more. And for me, for spend, someone who spent a lot of time in policy, you know, lots of folks in government spend a lot of time writing reports and generating things that really just a small community of people actually read. You know, my mom loves me unconditionally. I think she's amazing. She does not read all the reports I read, right? Or the law review articles I draft. And that says something. So how do you give a second life to things that's amazing content and provide it through a website so people can learn about the story behind the story? You know, one of the things I want to focus on the show is the slaughter of Christians and the minorities in the Middle East. There has been a lot of great reporting about this. Lots of amazing people have risked their lives to learn more about what's going on. The question now is, do we know about it? No. Because unless you thought to go to their website, unless you were at some UN committee meeting about this or some congressional testimony meeting, you just wouldn't have heard about it because it didn't make the sound bite on the news because, frankly, that didn't generate advertising. And so for us, how do you find those reports curated thoughtfully in a platform so if you watch a show and say this is interesting, you can go on your device, because more people are watching these shows on the device, to the actual link and see what's actually out there and who are the best partners to do that with, whether it be governments or civil society organizations. So that's my, my hope, is to better engage people who, but for this new platform, may not have a chance to engage. I spent um, a Thursday evening with two congressmen, uh, one from Republican, one from Democratic side. And the question of one of the uh, 
group was, is it really like a house of cards? So really didn't know what to do with that question. But do you think that the, we just have these stories that are really resembling what the truth is? Or we are exaggerating? So we're exaggerating because the way you make things interesting in television is to, to bring you in, right? And so something that's a constant debate within the creative team I'm part of, we have writers that are amazing guys. And when they do think something that I think is ridiculous, some guys, can we re really? And they're like, relax, it's fiction. And that is the theme every time we have a discussion. It is just fiction. It's basically trying to tell a story and there's lots of things going on. But what we recognize, I think, those folks in this room is the fact when you tune in and they want to hook you, that's thoughtfully done. They were working really hard to hook you in, to keep you watching. And so it's not reality, but it's a way that we try to live out reality through a medium. Alex, do you think, I know that the time was up, but today I mastered the time, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think, Alex, that these new stories will do something that will seem normal, though in the value system is not really something that we want to live upon? I think a value system is almost a question of religion. Um, and yeah, I mean, we should be discussing um, what's our religion. Um, but, you know, at the same time, there is, um, you know, we, we talk about this term education. Uh, you know, education is essentially a subsidized source of information. Um, and, you know, the governments are subsidizing certain types of information uh, to be more accessible. You know, in, in fact, sometimes it's subsidized to the extent that it's forced upon uh, people. So, um, you know, Mark is, is, is describing how we need to make uh, imp important things appealing. Um, but then I think it's, it's a question of, uh, you know, public policy to, to make certain types of information and content um, accessible by, um, you know, not requiring payment without making it free, you know, essentially by subsidizing access. And, you know, for example, we have libraries that are paper institutions from a paper era. Libraries in, in the digital age are basically ways to subsidize information access, you know, without expecting the creators of that information to work for free. I'm so happy because here again, Slovenia has really interesting answer because in September there will be an open education um, conference organized by UNESCO discussing these things and Slovenia is chairing that. So um, again, I'm, I'm so proud to live in Slovenia. So with that, I would really like to invite Andrei Peciak, who is an uh, inventor himself, um, being here, talking about the mobility and how electric mobility will change our lives. Dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, oh, um, there it is. There, there, there. Thank you. I will speak about mobility, so we will change our course a little bit. Uh, what's the basics of our changes? The basics is this, going electric. But is it a really big change? Who of you has been driving electric car till now? Please raise your hands. And did you experience any real change? Probably not, it's a little bit more silent. You have to charge it in a different way. Oh, yeah, that's the difference. And the difference is where the fuel comes from. And that's the huge difference. It will make global, political, uh, and economical changes. There is also another thing. Uh, electric car is very suitable for automated driving. So maybe in 10 or 20 years, we won't have jobs like truck driver or taxi driver anymore. Who are we? We are a small private-owned institute. That's what is our mission, what we do. But you know, unfortunately, uh, we have to survive, so you have, we have to do some more boring things like this. Uh, that was one of the uh, impossible things we did. Two years ago, we drove 826 kilometers per single charge see the speed, 72 per an hour on average. And of course, you can imagine our new goal is 1,000 
driving 100 per an hour. Maybe the next goal then will be in miles. It will be even more challenging. But our vision goes far, far beyond transport because in our vision, cars and energetic systems will be connected. So car will be part of the energetic system. Not just taking the energy, but also giving the energy. That's our vision, <coughs> the sustainable energy cycle. So every day you drive maybe 50 kilometers with your car being electric, for instance, but once a week, you would maybe like to drive 500 kilometers. So you have a battery that is basically much too big for your need. But during the week, you can use this battery as a storage for sustainable energy. And it's just the beginning. You can also connect other devices having batteries. That's the way how it works. <coughs> I presented this idea at World Technology Award in the United States, and it was very well accepted, and I see that some companies are already implementing it. Of course, we also made some prototypes, not only, only in our house, but also in some other places. <coughs> and you can see, <coughs> you can have direct charging of vehicles. You can connect to the system uh, vehicles you, you use only sometimes, for instance, scooters, uh, tractors, uh, leisure boats. And you can also use as a storage the used batteries from cars. So give the batteries second life. Don't make a waste out of them. After 10 years, it can no longer be used in a car, but it can be used for another 10 years in a storage for a house. So here it comes to connect the energetic system with, with the whole uh, transport system. That's our latest project. It has a big difference. It has a foldable solar roof. So when the car is parked, you have a big, big area covered with solar cells, so the car is not only consumer of energy, but it's only a, also a generator of the energy. And connected in a system, it can contribute, if you imagine billions of cars, it can com contribute to the energy needs of the planet. Now that's the basic question. What's the future of our mobility? If we keep going on like this, we will probably end up like this. But please, don't think it's an environmental. We have 1.2 billion cars at the moment in the world, and imagine 2.5 billion horses with all the methane they exhaust. <laughs> so it's not really environmental. We have to find other solutions. And of course, solutions are technology is ready, but are we ready? Our hope is in young generations. They are ready. But the problem we have is that the education we give them is the education for the world that is expiring. We don't teach them for the world of the future. And that's our problem. So my message to you is don't wait for the technology to change you. Change by yourself. Change your minds. Don't wait for the technology. The technology is ready. We can do it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> do you think the speed, oh, I like this picture. <laughs> do you think the speed of change is basically really stop because we know that technology is always faster than the, uh, all the laws, faster than education. But are we consciously stopping the change? And is it maybe good? Is it maybe good because we do a pause whilst delaying it a bit? Or do you think we should completely do it uh, the other way around? No, we, we, have, we have to change. Uh, we have to follow the changes because we simply can't stop them. The world is growing so fast, it has never grown in history by, uh, by innovations, but also by population. And if you want to feed that population, you need uh, innovations. So we have to change. We cannot allow ourselves to take a, a rest, to take a breath. We just have to run because everything is running. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting perspective. Terry, maybe a comment there? <laughs> we have to, well, you know, we're constantly e evolving. Uh, and, and part of it is interesting as I listen to the technology, and I came up in media and technology, it's also about learning about human technology. Um, and, you know, they said that the most expensive piece of real estate is the six inches between the left and the right ears. Uh, and, and so for me, <laughs> as we, uh, you know, we innovate, uh, it, it, it's coming back to 
you know, learning how we operate so we can actually innovate even more. Um, and because it will be here. <laughs> and so it, it, it's recognizing in our, the Young Global Leader, you know, group, and I, I was, you know, started in 2009. I don't remember when you, you did. Um, and we started a module called Protect the Asset. Uh, and and it was again that recognition. These are all these hop, high powered, you know, young people who are starting all these companies, the Googles and the YouTubes and everything. Uh, and uh, and yet it wasn't that again recognition that you are the asset, and for you to build personal sustainability, um, it is to understand your technology, which is the brain, the body, it, the mind body connection. And so it's not no longer this sort of new agey thing, um, and it is critical um, to innovation and sustainability. Um, as we talk about all these wonderful technologies. So <laughs> that's what came to me as I right. was listening. Again, as a baby of technology and a lover of technology, is we first need to understand our human technology. Great, I, I like it. Andre, thank you very much. And uh, now the question, who of you heard about blockchain? Okay, almost majority. Who of you who raised your hand can explain what blockchain technology is? With that, Team Mitya, please come on on stage. Team Mitya Lata, an entrepreneur who is developing blockchain technology and creating the future of the new economy. Team, with you we'll have a <laughs> quiz because uh, we are all talking about about blockchain, about opportunities, about everything. But can you please explain, and I'm so happy that not everybody raised their hand because I, I heard about it. I think I might know what it is, but I don't think I really understand it. So can you explain it the way that even my grandma <laughs> or my ma or me would understand what blockchain is? Uh, the short answer is probably no. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, let me try to, or think of your, if you can explain why, what the internet is. Um, in 2010, it was like 16, 16th of September, um, I bought my grandmother a computer. Uh, she was 78. And um, I handled her the laptop and um, she was afraid of it. And I was like, you know, it's, no, it's no not No worries, go. you yeah. know who mastered <laughs> the time today, so yeah. please. So I was like, you know, if you don't spill something or it, or, you know, if it fell down the, the table, everything's going to be okay, you know. And she, she loves, um, you know, doing the, the, the crosswords and uh, she loves cooking. And to her, internet is, you know, finding the, the right keywords for the crosswords and, uh, and to find the recipes on the internet. Um, and now I can explain to you what blockchain is for me. Um, I'm in startup business for like, I did uh, two rounds of traditional venture capital fundraising. Um, so we raised our angel and seed round, uh, 500,000 euros. Uh, that was six, uh, three years ago. But blockchain enabled us to raise for the next company uh, 10.5 million in five weeks from 3,500 participant investors. Um, so basically, it, it was, it's the first time for startups, it's not important uh, where are you geographically located, because if you have like a, a good idea and if you can present it to, to the worldwide audience, uh, you can do it now. So right now, this is what enables for the entrepreneurs. Okay, but technology is something, what you are talking about is something else. So what is the difference yeah. so we'll understand? Because we it's all know and then it's Bitcoin and it's uh, yeah. currencies. So how to put it systematically, we'll understand it better. Um, sure, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very bright thing, you know. I mean, it's uh, as, as internet is and it will, it will go into the 
every vertical of the economy. And that's why it's so difficult to basically to, to, to explain it easily. Because um, um, if you think of internet, uh, like uh, 10 years ago, people were saying there's economy and e-economy. Right now, there's no, no such thing anymore. It's just one economy. And, uh, and basically, blockchains uh, are an enabler to, to, to program stuff and put it online in decentralized way. So, but that's, I mean, pretty much technical right now because this is where we are. Um, you know, if, if you try to explain yourself like what internet is like 20 years ago or 30, you would be talking about TCP IP protocols and stuff like that and people would be, you know, would have zero clue like what are you actually talking about. So, but how internet was explained in the beginning, it was with like uh, some cases like how it is used. So right now we have like only a few use cases on blockchain. So can you give us like three? We'll understand it better. Um, yeah. So one thing is for sure, financial sector is uh, it's looking into it extremely. Because um, um, so there's there's one industry. Uh, there's an insurance industry that's going to change completely. And uh, but essentially what what it will what blockchain will enable. It's a uh, it's a governance. So basically, how things are run, uh, whether it's a company or a country. Um, but first, it's gonna happen in a small, you know, small entities like uh, you know some some companies. But um, but later on, it will it will go deeper. Can you give me the mic? Um, Slovenia is not a small entity at all. It's the right size entity. And uh, minister, I know. Blockchain is also on your agenda. So can you explain what the right size entity will do with it? I said I will be only the, the audience today, but I'm in ideal job because I like to talk. <laughs> uh, first, to try to explain what's blockchain. Uh, as I understand it, yeah. it's when you are able to write the rules of some transaction in a block and you control if everyone is following that rules and then the transaction is done and everyone is noticed about the transaction. This is very simply said how I understand the blockchain. Team, is this yeah, it's correct? A, it's a public ledger and you cannot change you it. You already complicated. <laughs> so, yeah. You already complicated. <laughs> if you are able to write down the rule of some transaction and write it in a block, crypt it, then you have first block. And then you can do transactions based on that rule. That's important for us. And uh, this is wh where we are trying. Another thing about blockchain is very important. We have distributed media, it's called internet. On the internet, we have distributed information, next layer, knowledge and everything. On this, we have distributed economy, you describe it. And now we have centralized supporting mechanisms like currency, taxes and everything else. And with the blockchain, we can distribute also this supporting mechanism. So it's, from by my belief, logical evolution of distributed technology that we are living every day in. And, and just a comment that you said about uh, how to uh, arrange that, that world, that internet world, for me is very simple. It's one, it's real and digital, and in digital we have to apply the same rules as we, as we have in the real world. So we need to control it, we need to have political decisions, otherwise we will have uh, world where, where corporations are, which are not elected are ruling. And the problem is that that second digital world is a little bit technical and politicians usually do not, do not understand it so they don't deal with it. But it's the same, only it's digital. You cannot touch it, but the rules are the same. Minister, when you start talking about control, I saw team like really shaking. So this will be a debate uh, afterwards. But uh, team, uh yeah, I just need to add something uh, again, a little bit more <laughs> technical, but maybe not. So uh, the the key thing of blockchain is that uh, you can send around to regionals, and you cannot do this in, on the internet. So basically, uh, the the internet technology is how it works now. It's always basically it copies, you know, you, you always copy something to, 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 to your computer. And now you can send uh, digital, uh, uh, basically original around in, in digital form. So that's the, the major difference. Um, why is Slovenia 
there is so much knowledge about this because we can see economy that really was uh, the best in crowdfunding. Uh, we have the uh, Bitcoin stock exchange and so on. So why? What is happening here? Why? Um, yeah, I guess uh, that's the advantage of a small country. So if, if right somebody does... Right-sized country, team, right-sized country. Sorry? Right-sized yeah, country, yeah, yeah. never right small. Right-sized country, yeah. <laughs> Um, so basically, if something works, you know, people realize about that and they try to repeat it, and that's normal. So that's 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 why we're here. I asked Matthias uh, while creating, is it he excited about technology? I need to ask you the same question: Are you excited about the technology or implications that it can bring? Um, so yeah, I'm like, I have like technological background, and uh, I was super excited about. Uh, about uh, you know what, how this will basically implement into into the reality. Uh, but I also studied soci uh, sociology, so um, it you know in the end of the day, it's always about how it's going to change the people's behavior, and um, and that's basically what blockchain will do in the in the you know when it matures. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about blockchain. Is, are we, should we be afraid of the bubble that happened to internet and uh, dot-com bubble? Um, of course, I mean, there's going to be a bubble because that's always like that with the, when the, the new technology uh, gets uh, adopted. Uh, right now we're in super early stage and uh, um, we will see like in, in pricing terms, yeah, there's going to be a huge drop soon. And uh, because with also with all every new technology, you know, attracts like some people that try to abuse it. And basically this is something that we try to kind of fight against or basically to, to, to educate people that they will learn like, uh, you know, which, which projects are uh, doing something uh, as they should and uh, which they don't basically do that. So that's kind of something with you know, that you can do it to educate people and to basically to, to talk about the technology and how uh, the industry works. Team Mitya, but we can see you are excited and yeah. we'll follow economy and we hope it goes to the stars. And thank you very much for Thanks. being here. Thanks. <laughs> when I said that I'm mastering time, of course it was not true. So tell me, what, what are we, we are done? Uh, <laughs> no, no, we are not done actually. Uh, one learning from each of you, please, like quick, in 30 seconds, what is something that you heard today that changed a bit your perspective or make it more your perspective? I, um, what, what, what I'm seeing is a kind of a resonance. Uh, I, um, I'm, I'm very optimistic seeing that uh, many of us are feeling the same thing. And I thought I was isolated in my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Crystal? Actually, uh, what I learned and maybe already knew is that um, uh, your love from Slovenia is very strong. And what I notice here, and it's really different from in the Netherlands, we have to learn like to slow down, to do the, the, the meditation, to do the mindfulness. But if I walk here in the, in the villages, people know about that. They know about the herbs, they know about, they talk about energy like it is talking about the weather. So that small country is not that small. If you flat it, all the mountains are gone. It's a really big country. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to hand this to Mark because I want to answer your question in a different way. But um, so thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure being here. I think it, just being reminded to pause is incredibly powerful. Um, so for that as a takeaway, also the power of education. And with that, I would be remiss if I didn't compliment our hostess um, for A, just an amazing session today, but B, for serving on the advisory board for the American Slovenian Education Foundation. Uh, for no better place than this, this type of venue to uh, tell and educate everyone here that there is a foundation out there that helps support uh, students from Slovenia to study in the United States and students in the United States to study here in Slovenia. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity to engage the business community for the next generation to ensure the education applies on both sides of the Atlantic for all our students. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. So 
actually, I think I just deleted what I was looking at. But, um, you know, that Slovenia is the right size. So that, that was the one thing. Cause, you know, it is an interesting um, testing ground, actually, for a lot of forward thinking, you know, things. Uh, and there was a, there's a story that you might have heard, and let me see if I can remember it. Uh, and it's a, it's a story, of, and you may know this, um, of um, everybody, somebody, nobody, and, and anybody. Uh, and, and there was an important job to do, uh, and, and everybody thought that you know, anybody could do it, but nobody did it. Uh, and I'm going to do a short, you know, version of it. But somebody got mad um, that that nobody did it, even though by, even though it was everybody's job. <laughs> um, and and so I'm giving you the shortened version of it. But it's really about it is everybody's job, and we shouldn't rate, wait for somebody else to do it. Uh, and 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 that's what the transformation in this new kind of changing reality is, is that we each um, have that responsibility um, to be full in uh, and in transforming um, the world. And Slovenia, uh, the lesson for me is that this is a great place to, to do it and to start. So thank you. Well, with that, I never said to her that we are the green reference country and we want to be. And with that, believe in Slovenia, just be loved, enjoy the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.